Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, president and editor-in-chief of DevX. This week, we'll be breaking down the big headlines in global development and bringing in some top experts to help us do it. If you want to follow along with the stories we're talking about, check out devx.com and subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Newswire. There's a link in the description. Follow us along on Twitter, and you can see many of the stories we're talking about today. And we'd love to hear what you think. This is This Week in Global Development. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Global Development, where we talk about all the big headlines in global development. I'm Raj Kumar. I'm the President and Editor-in-Chief here at DevX, and delighted to be back with all of you who are listening in. And I'm joined by two guests this week, my colleague, Kate Warren. Hey, Kate. Hey, Raj. How are you doing? Doing great. And Kate, of course, is an executive editor here at DevX. And we've got a special guest, uh, Erthrin Cousin. Hi, Erthrin. Hi, Raj. It's great to be with you this morning. Great to hear your voice. And you, you need no introduction to this audience. But everybody, <laughs> I think, knows the many, many hats you've worn over the years, including as the executive director of the World Food Program. You were the U.S. ambassador to all the food agencies in Rome and so many other roles in the food space. And you're now the founder and CEO of Food Systems for the Future. So just great to have, have you here, have both of you here. Uh, really looking forward to our discussion. I don't think it's too late to say happy International Women's Day. What do you think? It is never too late to say happy International Women's Day. Don't we International get a whole month Women something? 365. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Is it a week? Is it a month? Maybe it should be the whole year. But uh, it's great to be with the two of you. And we've had a couple of our DevEx colleagues who are at the uh, at CSW, the Commission on the Status of Women in New York, covering all that's happening there. So stay tuned to some of those stories. Uh, the other big thing that's going on this week is the uh, South by Southwest. And I think, Kate, you're down in Texas, aren't you? I am. I'm in my hometown of Austin um, for South by, as the cool kids call it. Um, and it's been a exhausting but uh, really exhilarating week. Nice. And Earth, and I forget if you were down there yourself. Indeed, I was there on Saturday for a couple of events, and uh, it's quite the experience. What it does, Raj, I must be honest, it makes me feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet it will have that effect on all of us. I haven't been there myself, but yeah, I mean, give us a sense, Kate, of the vibe. What is, what is, because you're a veteran, so what is South By all about? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, what I find so fun and different about it is it, it's really sectorless and that it brings people from, you've got musicians and filmmakers along with nonprofit leaders and, um, you know, government workers yeah, everyone coming together um, that's really excited about talking about how to make our future better and more equitable. Um, you know, I find that we are often in similar spaces talking to the, you know, the same people about the same things that can feel a little bit like an echo chamber. Um, and this is an opportunity to kind of really break out of that and meet people who are maybe working on a similar challenges, but from a very different perspective. Um, you know, one person I was speaking to here described South by as being echo less um, because, you know, every conversation you're able to engage with somebody that maybe, you know, you wouldn't have met in a different setting. Um, and I find there's a lot of interesting ideas and inspiration that can come from that. Um, and I know some groups in the global development space have been starting to come here because of that, um, particularly in the food space. There's a lot of food folks that have been walking around here, a lot of different food events. In fact, I'm getting ready to head to a, an event that Food Tank is hosting today. Um, but climate, health, um, a lot of our community is starting to see this as an interesting convening space to get exposed to new ideas, particularly at the intersection of tech and AI and innovation. So if I can jump in for a second, Raj, I, I really Please appreciated do. Kate's comments and and um, the, the 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 group that is in heavy and significant attendance down in South is a lot of young entrepreneurs as well as funders, VC funders, um, and so the conversations around food tech and ag tech and new uh, food companies. Uh, is always quite interesting. It's, it's 
at at South by um and the the so in addition to all the governments that you have there you have a lot of corporates there but you have different corporates than the leaders that you would see at some place like Davos uh you have a lot of the folks who are looking for new ideas and innovation from the corporations who are there but I was part of a conversation I thought was really interesting first of all let me just say I was on a on a panel with no one that I knew all new people and the audience was feel, filled with people so, because as Kate said too often in these conversations we're talking to each other but this was such a different audience of interested and committed young people in the space of of food and ag and one of the issues that came up that I think is is important for your audience to be aware of is that in 2023 85 food and ag companies in the first half of the year filed bankruptcy. And when we were all looking at the numbers in 2019 and 2020 of new VC capital that was coming into the food space, what we're seeing now at the end of 2023 and the beginning of 2024 is a lot of that capital beginning to sit on the sidelines because of concerns that those of us in the space are aware of, and that is that there you don't grow unicorns on farms. And so the kinds of returns that to traditional VC capital is looking for when they make investments, you will rarely ever find in the food or ag space, regardless how sexy the idea may be. Yeah, that's interesting. And it means, you know, we got to find other ways to incentivize investment in this space. I love the fact that we're talking innovation because so much of what's happening in the food space right now is really, and rightfully so, kind of doom and gloom stories, right? I mean, we're looking at what situation in Gaza, in Ukraine, in Yemen, and we had a big piece out this week by Colin Lynch, our UN correspondent, talking all about what's kind of happening along the lines of weaponizing food. And it's, I'm sure it's something you've seen up close and knowing your history at the World Food Program, they're dealing with every day now. I, I don't know if you saw that story, Arthur, but what, what's your broad sense of what's going on in the food security space? Sure. And I really, indeed, I did see that story. I love reading Column's writing. He, he is always so thoughtful and um and has a has a tendency to to uh ensure that we are looking at not just the issues of today but recognizing that in a historical perspective and in a historical context and the reality is that um food as a weapon of war is an issue that we have discussed as a community of interest for for throughout the time for, throughout all conflicts but the reality is that, as Column noted in his story, is that during the 1990s and 2000s, we began to recognize, and, and, and we have the resolutions to support it, the UN resolutions to support it, that um, there's a lack of humanity in the use of food as, as a weapon of war. But the reality is right now, that seems to be ignored by those in, in, in many in many countries because of if you are not calling it a weapon but it ha it has the effect of 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 a weapon because of how civilians are harmed by the lack of access to food then um as as the old adage goes a rose by any other name is still a rose so if you're not calling it a weapon of war but it is affecting women and children and is causing death of those women and children it is indeed a weapon and what that is what we have we are we are seeing in in we've set, we saw it in Syria um we saw it in in Ukraine and and now unfortunately in Gaza um now i would i would 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 take uh i i would disagree with column on yemen i do not believe that the 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 issue of food and the distribution of food in yemen is based on the is is being used as I, I do I do not believe that is being used as a as a weapon in this case. Yemen has 
a significant challenge with the Houthis not allowing WFP to provide the access that is necessary to support the, the population in need. And as a result, the U.S. is responding to WFP's inability to, to, to access that population by, by holding the food until such time as they are given that access. And just for, for listeners who aren't aware of this context, essentially the U.S. has a large amount of wheat that is, that is destined for the World Food Program to distribute in Yemen, and it's being held in, in warehouses in the UAE in a port. And the issue here that Colm has reported on in this story and in some prior stories as well is, well, kind of what's the holdup? Why is it why is it being held there in the UAE? And it sounds like, Richard, you're saying, well, it's not really a bargaining chip, as, as he puts it, to determine kind of how does food get distributed in the country, but instead it's just a reality that WP doesn't have the access it needs, so the food isn't needed right now, and so it's sitting out there in the port. Is is that kind of you know to paraphrase I, I would, you? Is I, that I, I would I, I think your paraphrase is accurate to a point. The the to the suggestion that the food is not needed, the food is of course indeed needed by by the the population uh, of women of, of civilians inside of Yemen. But the reality is that without access, the food cannot be delivered. And the Houthis are not providing WFP with the necessary access to ensure their ability to deliver that food. Yeah, I guess it's a fine distinction um, as to, you know, Colm and maybe his sources would argue that it's the lack of access is being kind of exemplified by holding this food back instead of bringing it into the country. And that that sort of shows the Houthis, look, the food's here. Uh, If you want it, you've got to work with us, play ball on how it gets distributed. But I, I see your point which is you're looking from the other perspective that, well, there, there is an access. So of course we can't bring it in right now if there's no way to actually distribute it. Um, so maybe this is a slightly different case than, than some of the other examples he's bringing up, at least in your mind. In, in my mind, it definitely is a very different case. Okay, interesting. But the broader trend holds true from your perspective that food is being used more generally in these kinds of humanitarian crisis situations as a tool and it's effectively harming civilians in in large numbers even as you know the intention the stated intention might be well we want to keep this from you know combatants who might have access to it and be able to sell it or use it uh, as, as a tool themselves I, I unfortunately would. I, I agree that um, in those situations where where the, the the political negotiators are negotiating humanitarian access and that becomes a bargaining chip for political compromise, that is that you can't call it anything other than what it is. It is it is being it is it is as any other weapon that those negotiators would have on the table, they are using food. And that is to the detriment of millions of people in in um in conflict situations. Yeah, interesting. Interesting to get your take on that, and, and I love the the uh, argument you've got here with the way Colin has phrased this and positioned it. I think it's a legit debate to have, and I can certainly see his perspective or the other side of it from the people he's spoken to. Are you interested in the intersection of business and social impact? Do you want to know how corporate sustainability, ESG, impact investing, and more can contribute to development finance? My name is Adva Saldinger. I'm a senior reporter at DevEx, and I've been reporting on these issues for nearly a decade. I'm the author of DevEx Invested, our free weekly newsletter dedicated to development finance. Every Tuesday, we explore how companies, investors, and market mechanisms are reshaping the world of development finance. Visit devex.com slash newsletters and join us on Tuesdays. You know, WFP itself is, you know, going through a challenging 
time because the number of people who need its support, I'm thinking about what's going on in Haiti as an example, uh, is just growing and growing. And its ability to raise funds is really under pressure given the politics here in the US, but really everywhere in the world. Uh, you know, what's your sense of kind of the moment that WFP is in right now? I, I, I uh, had the opportunity to speak with Cindy McCain during the um, Munich Security Conference and uh, and she, as as the new leader of WFP, is is doing everything in her power to talk to as many global leaders as possible to unlock the capital that is necessary to support the provision of food required to feed those in not only these conflict situations that we're discussing, but in other emergency situations. And unfortunately, David Beasley, as a consummate fundraiser, had increased the resources of the agency almost twofold over the time that I was there. And uh, unfortunately, Cindy's time, because Cindy is as as leader now, is finding herself in a situation where she is even below ha almost half the dollars that uh, I raised during my last year as executive direct uh, director. And as you note, that is directly related to the domestic politics that we are seeing here in the United States today, that we're witnessing in the United States today with the with the lack of a supplemental that will provide the access to the capital that is necessary for for increasing the dollars to meet the growing needs in all of these situations and then you have uh, the, the 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 balance of the global community um the significantly reducing their their contributions as well and the results of all of 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 those reductions from the from 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 different countries is resulting in a a situation where not only is she of course cutting staff as she should do when she when when the 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 agency is in such financial challenge, but she is being forced to reduce the amount of food that she is that she is capable of delivering to those in such desperate situations. And the the I think the the place that is suffering most is a place we don't often talk about. And we haven't spoken about this morning, and that's Sudan. I don't think anyone who is who is paying attention would argue that we are in famine like conditions in Sudan today and that you have hundreds of thousands of women and children who are on the verge of 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 famine and yet the food that is necessary is not is 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 not being provided by any of the agencies because of lack of financial resources particularly the the food wfp does not have the financial resources to meet the needs of that population yeah it's a great point sudan kind of is at the very top of a bunch of lists of crises to watch in 2024, including that of the IRC, um, and kind of sadly deserves to have that position. Um, let's move on maybe some other, other stories here. Kate, I, I wonder if you saw the piece uh, that our colleague Alyssa Miolene uh, put out about this, this tip between USAID and Zimbabwe, um, and, and if you had a thought about it, or maybe want to share with our listeners what, what it was all about. Yeah, so um, I did see that, and you know, it brought to mind, and a little bit on Colin's piece, which I found a really interesting thing to ponder is just the breakdown of humanitarian norms. Um, and I think it was Nazi as maybe was quoted as saying, kind of the heyday of humanitarianism is maybe past us as far as us all collectively being able to adhere to some standard norms, even in the times of crisis and war, and. You know, here at South Eye, we've been talking a lot about the impact of the U.S. elections and what that will mean globally. Um, I heard from Comfort Eero, the president and CEO of International Crisis Group, and Ben Rhodes, former deputy national security advisor, talking about U.S. leadership in a multipolar world and really this lack of trust, um, particularly in U.S. leadership, that no matter which way this election goes, whether it's a Biden or a Trump victory, that trust has already been eroded. Um, and people seeing the U.S. as a place that they can come to, whether it's for an agreement or funding and feeling secure in that partnership, um, has gone away. 
So that read, and we're reading Alyssa's story around, um, you know, this tiff between USAID and Zimbabwe, where they were accusing USAID of interfering and trying to sway their elections, just kind of brought all that together for me on how U.S. leadership, while we are having you know, our own internal challenges with elections and democracy, and our ability to be that power out there in the world, demonstrating even maybe funding around how other countries should be doing their elections. Um, so those were some of the things that, that came to mind as I was thinking about that story in particular um, and some of the backlash they had against, you know, U.S., um, you know, not really having the moral standing to criticize some of the way that they were doing things in Zimbabwe. Yeah, it's fascinating to me because it exactly makes your point, right? The Zimbabwean ambassador spoke with Alyssa and, you know, we know from so much reporting that there's not really a strong argument to back up Zimbabwe's position here. I mean, they they have been accused of severe governance and accountability issues over, over quite a long period of time. And this government in particular uh, is has been targeted by the by the U.S. government. Um, I guess there have been sanctions that have been placed on the president and other senior government officials for corruption and human rights abuses. And and this is maybe a tit for tat. Those sanctions were placed, and as a result, Zimbabwe is looking to to find a way to push back on the U.S. But it's amazing because the Zimbabwean ambassador, right to your point, in speaking with our with our colleague, essentially said look at your own backyard in the U.S. You know, don't accuse us of having a weak democracy. Look at your own democracy. Um, and, and it just shows, I think, that this trust that's been eroded across the global South has some real consequences because we hear a lot about it as something that's kind of soft. And here's a case where it's actually come out in the real world. It's not just an opinion. It's actually had a real world consequence of USAID uh, being kicked out and and a real consequence for work that's happening in a critical place. Uh, Earthra, you've had to deal with this level of international incident in your many uh, years as an ambassador and as the head of a UN agency. H how did you read this story about Zimbabwe and USAID? Yeah, I, I got to tell you, and I, as I listen to you all talk, it, it, it's, it's disconcerting because having had the privilege of serving as the U.S. ambassador for Food and Ag and, and, and the permanent representative to FAO, when the U.S. would speak, the world would listen because not only because of our financial commitments then and our financial support to many of the countries the, the developing across the developing world but because of our our political moral compass and uh, i that that's that statement that was just that uh was just used about the lack of trust that um erodes us authority and U.S. position in uh, on the global stage um, and based upon what is perceived as our as our our of our our, our lack of 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 a, of a moral compass on our on the domestic front be and and uh, I fear that, and, and as I talk to friends and colleagues across the global community, there is concern about the displacement of the U.S. as a, as a humanitarian leader, as a political leader, on the, the thorny issues that are facing us as a global community. And the there are those in the global in the, in in the, in the global community who will use our domestic issues to undermine our credibility in the international community, and this is something that should concern us all. Yeah, agreed. I hear this more and more from leaders in our space, thinking about things like PEPFAR reauthorization, and if that doesn't get reauthorized. You know, even if, even if the funding still flows, the message that it sends to our partner countries around the world, the sense that the U.S. isn't a reliable ally and leader on these issues, as Kate, you uh, you said, I think there's real consequences, real world consequences. And this might just be one of those early examples of, of what we may see more of going forward. I, I'm sorry to say, but it might be. 
You know, another story we had out this week, um, our senior, uh, our colleague, uh, Jenny Lee Ravella, who's a senior reporter here, did a piece about the pandemic fund. And, you know, I'd love to get your take on this, Earthrin and Kate, because, you know, this is a model that we've seen a few examples of. And so the pandemic fund was set up because the world said, hey, we've got to find a way to be better prepared for the next one. Uh, and we need to quickly raise some funds and we need to have it somewhere that can kind of host and organize this. And the World Bank turned out to be the logical place. And so they put it there. And it's been able to raise about $2 billion. We're trying to raise more this year. The total gap annually for pandemic preparedness is like 10 and a half billion. So it's just a small drop in the bucket of what's needed, but it's still a, a sizable sum. Well, now some other countries are saying, look, we don't think that the pandemic fund is necessarily the right model for all of the funding in this area because it's not as representative as we'd like it to be of global south countries so it fits potentially with the same theme we were just talking about mm -hmm. and so there's a little bit of a movement as the piece talks about of trying to maybe create a new a new fund um and i wonder knowing this space how hard it is to raise money the, the challenging questions about how to organize these kinds of funds where they should sit should they be independent like the green climate fund and have its own kind of board and set up or should it be you know, hosted within an institution like the World Bank? How you see this, this issue, Earthrun? I, I, the, I think the World Bank has proven itself as a, as a credible um, multilateral financial institution, yet the geopolitics between the U.S. and China and the growing division that that is creating between many in the, in the Global South and the World Bank is a reflection of what you're seeing with this fund. I, I was not surprised by the, the, the suggestion that, that uh, there would be another fund. My fear is, is, is less about which fund where and the challenge of raising enough funds through, through whatever the vehicle to support the outcomes that we need to achieve in uh, preparing for the next pandemic, as opposed to the argument about the where should the funds sit, the questions that we need to raise are where are the dollars required? Yeah, although the two things are connected, right? Like think about the loss and damage fund that came out of the latest COP. And there was a big controversy. Should it sit at the World Bank? A lot of Global South countries said no, for this very reason. They want more of a voice in it. But the donor countries said yes, because we trust the World Bank and we have a bigger share and voice at the World Bank and it's our money and we want to control it. So, you know, in the end, getting the donors to pony up in this very tough political environment it's easier to do that if they have more, more vote, more control. Uh, and so the, the two things in some ways are connected. I, I wonder, Kate, if you saw this piece and if you have any reaction to it. Yeah, well, I know, I, I think also there's no perfect model, right? So it, I do think this gets back to just the lack of trust from the global south to the global north. Um, and particularly when it comes to pandemic pre uh, preparedness and thinking about, okay, the next pandemic comes, they're going to be looking back at how we handled the last one and, and uh, an obvious lack of trust there. But then there's also just the um, practicalities around setting up a new fund, a new institution, a new infrastructure, um, the time and resources that would take and any efficiencies lost there that I think are, are trade-offs um, that we've seen again with the Green Climate Fund. Um, so I think it's, you know, finding that that balance and and perhaps, you know, no matter where this institution is housed, I think there will still be that tension between making sure Global South has appropriate representation. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's really at the heart of it. And whether it's in the World Bank or not, that's the issue that really needs to be tackled. Yeah, but I think that, that just Kate, to your point, the, my understanding is from uh, this fund in particular is, is one of the first where the Global South has as many seats as the donor countries the, 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 on, on the governing body 
of this board. I think it's the institution itself and not just necessarily the number of, of chairs around the table that are concerning to some in the global south. And I, I also think you cannot avoid the challenge of, of China's perspective on the World Bank. And as long as you are continuing to have this concern that China has and, and the, this desire that they have to have more uh, control over the institutions that uh, that's where where they contribute money, and as a result, many of the countries that are aligned in, with them uh, uh, take that position. You will have concerns about any fund that is a World Bank fund. Yeah, that's such an important point. I'm glad you made it that you can't divorce this from that big geopolitical question that's out there. It's not just about this particular initiative and this issue. It's a, it's a much broader geopolitical frame. Um, you know, before we, we wrap up, I want to mention a couple of stories and get your take on, on what's going on in Haiti. So just just quickly, uh, for those who are listening in, we may not have time to get to it. So I want to make sure you, you know that we've got a story about the new uh, incoming head of Gavi uh, at, at Sonia Nishtar and a story about kind of what are some of the big priorities for her there's a new strategy there. That's a, a story for our pro readers that I highly recommend people take a look at. This was also a past week where we had a, a the first digital summit at the World Bank. Uh, the first time the World Bank has hosted this, I was there on stage talking with leaders from OpenAI and Microsoft and other organizations, really looking at how AI can transform the kind of work that the World Bank and other institutions are doing on development. We've got a piece on that that's worth taking a look at. But I didn't want to wrap up without at least getting Arthur and your take on the situation in Haiti since it's developing so fast. And obviously it's a place that, um, that you know, the whole development community is really looking at right now. Did, did you have a, a take on what's going on there? <laughs> Haiti is, is and, and for the people of Haiti, it is the saddest place I ever visited as executive director of the World Food Program. And it's the challenge is that it only gets worse as you as you look at the prosperity of the US and other countries in this hemisphere. And to see Haiti is is by any definition a failed state. And this newest um challenge that they're facing with the gangs all coming together and forcing resignation of the leadership of the country, uh, the, the who suffers in this situation are the people. And the reality is those who can leave Haiti have gone. And the poorest and the most vulnerable are those who are now suffering from the, this, this latest conflict. And I can't help but think about what you were saying, Kate, earlier about trust. You know, in some ways, the same trust issues are playing out here where you know, local population looks at the history of interventions from overseas and says, do we really want more of this? Do we want more foreign soldiers, you know, uh, here? We remember what happened with the Nepalese peacekeepers and the, the spread of cholera and, of course, the long history of U.S. Marines and others there. So it's not easy. It's not as though, oh, well, let's just send in the foreign soldiers. And obviously there's uh, been a big effort to get Kenya to send uh, some police officers and Jamaica to send police officers. But while those efforts are taking place, the situation is spiraling out of control and doing the kind of basic food delivery that WFP has long done. It's really tough to do in an environment where there's no basic security and where, you know, even the airport is in question. Lack of access is one of the primary reasons that um, you will find that it increases in hunger. And this is a situation where all of the requirements that are necessary to support a viable um, humanitarian response, uh, the funding, the access, the humanitarian, the protection of humanitarian workers, none of those situations are evident or in place in Haiti today. And as a result, the po possibility of WFP or any of the other humanitarian organization having the capacity to provide the assistance that's necessary is non-existent. Yeah, that's yeah, and right. Just, and go ahead, Kate. Yeah, just you know, thinking that there's been a lot of conversation around that here this week um, in Austin, in conjunction with a lot of 
discussion around U.S. election. Obviously, I'm here in Texas where migration is a huge topic, um, political hot topic. Um, and I've been talking with several migration leaders and you know, looking at these rising crises, rising conflicts, whether it's um, from, from climate or from political strife. And, you know, the U.S. and other countries do have an interest in trying to quell some of this conflict because you might think it isn't going to come to your border, but here in Texas it, it is. And seeing some, um, you know, bipartisan support around U.S. engagement tied to migration. Um, maybe there's some controversy over how much to tie it to that or not, but uh, definitely seeing that as a big topic that people are considering this week here in Austin. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's certainly going to be a big topic in the U.S. election. And it makes me think that, boy, we got to make sure it's not a trade-off between long-term development and immediate emergency humanitarian aid, because if we don't do the long-term work, you end up with more crises like these right here in our backyard and more innocent people who are suffering and feeling the need to flee. Uh, you know, people don't want to flee if they can avoid it. They want to live where they live. And uh, it's, it's really awful to see what's going on in Haiti right now after so many years of efforts by so many people in this community. But it's a story we will certainly stay on top of here at DevX along with everything we talked about this week. And it has been such an absolute pleasure to be joined by you, Erthrin. Uh, thank you so much, Erthrin Cousin. Kate Warren and everybody who's listening in. This is This Week in Global Development. Thanks, Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate you. This has been This Week in Global Development. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe using the link in the description. To get even more coverage and analysis on the most pressing development issues of the day, become a DevX Pro member by going to devx.com slash membership and signing up. Thank you for listening and see you next week.